This lecture on ligation and transformation is part of the lecture series in molecular biology. DNA ligation and transformation is part of the recombinant DNA production where we ligate our gene of interest or some DNA sequence in some vector followed by its transformation in some host. Ligation and transformation takes place in different vectors. We may use plasmid or other vectors, but in this lecture, I will concentrate my talk on plasmid DNA. So there are several important features of a plasmid, especially these three are the most important one, origin of replication, selectable marker, and multiple cloning site. I have given details in one of my other lecture. Plasmids are circular DNA molecules. If we want to ligate our DNA of interest within a certain plasmid, we have to cut it open from the multiple cloning site. And here the plasmid may have sticky ends or it may have blunt ends. But before going further, we have to prepare our plasmid uh, to be ready for further ligation and transformation. One important step for plasmid preparation for DNA ligation is dephosphorylation. These phosphates are present on two ends of the uh, plasmid DNA when cut open by restriction enzymes. And there is a good chance that when we do this DNA ligase reaction, these uh, phosphates, they are joined again with their own hydroxyl within the same vector by a recircularization of the plasmid. So we want to avoid the, this recircularization because we want to insert our DNA of interest. So we remove these phosphates by using this uh, alkaline phosphatase enzyme. It may be from calf intestinal alkaline phosphatase or bacterial alkaline phosphatase. The enzyme which is being used mostly these days is some recombinant alkaline phosphatase which removes these phosphates. And when we now when we ligate our DNA of interest within this uh, plasmid, the phosphates from the from our gene of interest, they will ligate here. Or, and the other two ends where the phosphates are removed uh, from the plasmid DNA, they remain as such. And when they are transformed, this plasmid is transformed, uh, these two phosphates which were not present in the vector, this is repaired by the host system of DNA repair. So in this way, uh, we can ligate without allowing our vector to recircularize. Here is recipe of alkaline phosphatase. We add DNA like in 50 microliter total volume, 40 microliter DNA. And actually it is calculated in terms of picomoles of five prime ends, like 10 picomoles are mostly needed. I will discuss shortly how to calculate picomoles. Uh, and then there is a reaction buffer which is supplied in 10x concentration. We have to dilute it to 1x, so in 50 it will be 5 microliters. And CAAP, this is the enzyme's calf intestinal alkaline phosphatase. If it is available in this 0.01 units per microliter, we need 5 microliter of it. And you incubate at 37 Celsius for 60 minutes. And then we have to stop the reaction at higher temperature, 70 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes because uh, if residual alkaline phosphatase is less left in the reaction mixture and it is used as such for further ligation, then the phosphates from the from our gene of interest may be removed. And sometimes you may do it or you may omit this step. It depends how your uh, how the things are working out. So you can do this phenyl chloroform extraction followed by ethanol precipitation. Uh, of the DNA, of the plasmid DNA here to make it further uh, purify the uh, plasmid after alkaline phosphatase. This phenyl chloroform will remove uh, the residual proteins and ethanol precipitation uh, will help in the precipitation of the plasmid DNA. Highest efficiency of DNA ligation can be achieved if the ends of the vector DNA and the insert or our gene of interest, they are compatible sticky ends, meaning they are complementary to each other. 
but if they are incompatible sticky ends present uh, in the vector dna and in the insert then they are they cannot be ligated as such so we have to make those ends either compatible sticky ends or blunt ends blunt end ligation although is not that efficient as sticky end ligation but it is better than incompatible sticky ends so here is an example of filling up of these ends of the dna which are incompatible sticky ends so we can fill it up by using clano fragment of dna polymerase 1 this reaction we do it in vitro we can do it for our insert or for our vector and we can fill it up fill these ends up here by using this enzyme or we can also use this t4 dna polymerases dna polymerase which actually uh, removes these ends so these ends which are this overhang can be removed or it can be filled depending on what kind of cloning strategy you are you are working on so if it is filled or it is removed you can then ligate these blunt ends and you can see over here that uh, this eco r1 site is regenerated that you may use further depending on your cloning strategy but even if it is not regenerated these ends can be ligated after Uh, blending these either by this or by this method another uh, method of choice is using exonuclease 3 which removes nucleotides residues from 3 uh, prime end of a dna strand similarly if you want to remove nucleotide residues from 5 prime end of the dna you may use bacteriophage lambda exonuclease so in any case if uh, you have incompatible sticky ends you have to make those blunt ends so you can ligate those here is the recipe for dna ligation t4 dna ligase is mostly used but you can use some other enzyme available t4 dna ligase as other ligases makes phosphodiester linkages thus sealing the neck i have given a detail mechanism in one of my other lectures Uh, this is 10x concentrated dna ligase buffer so if we are making the reaction in 20 ml so to make it 1x use 2 ml t4 dna ligase 1 ml depending on the number of units present the most important thing is this vector and insert ratio and molar ratio of 1 to 3 vector to insert one vector to three insert is the best one i have used personally and also my students in my lab so and it is in terms of picomoles uh it is it may not be uh, true that the more is better here but it is better to maintain this ratio in terms of picomoles like here 0.02 picomoles of the vector and 0.06 picomoles of the insert or the gene of your interest so you calculate that to achieve this picomole how many nanograms and to achieve this picomole how much nanogram is needed so these are not 1 to 3 uh, uh, vector to insert ratio but this ratio is maintained in terms of picomoles and how to calculate this this you can easily calculate by using some of the uh calculators which are present online like here this is any b uh any bio calculator so you just put in the length of your insert the length of your vector and the vector dna mass which you have already quantified on by using spectrophotometer and here you can see the ratios are given here and as i mentioned that if we use 50 nanogram of vector then how much nanogram of uh, this insert is needed to achieve this uh, 3 to 1 ratio here 3 is the uh, your insert and 1 is the vector so this is 37.5 as mentioned in my uh, previous slide so you can use this much nanogram and this much nanogram to achieve this ratio and believe me 
uh, this is one of the best choices you will have for DNA ligation. And what are the reaction conditions for DNA ligation? So it depends if for sticky end ligation you need, you can achieve this at 22 Celsius for three hours or you can go like four to eight Celsius for 16 hours. Similarly, for blunt end ligation, uh, the temperature is much less, but the, you need more time in that case. So shorter duplexes require low temperatures as a result of their low melting temperature. So ligation reactions performed at low temperatures, they require longer incubation times. But you can optimize uh, these conditions based on the DNA ligase you are using. After ligation, you have to transform your ligated DNA in some bacterial strain of E. coli, which is most commonly used. Now, I will discuss how to select this bacterial strain. But before going into that, uh, I would like to overview some of the basic concepts. These gene names for these bacteria, they are mentioned as three lowercase italicized letters followed by an italic uppercase letter. And sometimes it is also followed by an italic Arabic number that specifies the precise mutation in question. For example, LACY1 is one of the genes and you can see these are the three lowercase italic letter followed by the uppercase italic letter. And this uh, number is given here. And similarly, this is for another one is for TRP31. So the same strategy used here. And these three letters, they are intended to stretch, uh, suggest function of the gene. However, sometimes superscripts are used in terms of plus and minus. They are added for clarity. Similarly, if uh, there is some deletion mutation, this symbol is used and followed by the name of the deleted genes in parentheses. Like for example, this lag pro 8 gene is deleted, so you use this symbol. And this symbol may be replaced with del, del, or d. Sometimes a phenotypic designation uh, is given in parentheses after the genotypic designation when it is not obvious, like if the uh, gene function is not obvious from the genotype, then uh, it is better to write down its phenotype in brackets, like as you can see here, RPSL104 is mutated and this, uh, this results in the STR and R. I will explain uh, uh, now when we are looking for some strain we have to check what is the genotype and phenotype of that particular strain. So what is genotype? Genotype indicates which genes are mutated in a particular strain. So for example, in E. coli, there are about 3,000 genes. So it is not possible to write down all 3,000 genes of the wild type strain of E. coli. So rather than writing down genotype in that sense, we write it just the mutated ones, the mutated genes in the strain. So th those will be, of course, very few as opposed to the wild type strain. So uh, genotype contains all the genes which are mutated and the phenotypes, phenotype describes the observable behavior of the strain because of those mutations in particular genes. So here are some of the examples which are quite straightforward like I men just mentioned TRP31 and you can see these are the uh, names of the genes and they come under genotype because these are mutated. And this is the phenotype, it is unitalicized except for where this name of the strain comes, otherwise these are not italicized. And they also contain uh, superscripts like minus, plus, R, S, R for resistant, S for sensitive. And in TRP31, this, is, this phenotype is TRP negative, meaning it requires tryptophan for growth. Otherwise, in wild type, it does not require tryptophan. It can make its own tryptophan. But by mutating this gene, it requires, you have to add tryptophan in the medium. Like, similarly, you are UVRA, 
and this becomes ultraviolet sensitive and it is sensitive to UV light this is the description of it uh, otherwise this uh, uh, this protein or this enzyme uh, uh, which is made because of this gene that protects it against the UV light but when it is mutated it becomes sensitive similarly other examples are there and some examples are not so straightforward like RPSL 104 and you can see this is STRR it means uh, if the strain is defective or it is mutated in this gene RPSL 104 uh, the effect is or the phenotype is it becomes resistant to streptomycin which is not quite straightforward similarly uh, these are other examples you can see which are not quite straightforward and in some cases one mutation may create several phenotypes like DM3 mutation uh, it uh, leads to these three different types of phenotypes DM minus uh, 2AP and similarly UVS UV sensitive and this is uh, uh, APS so it is sensitive to 2 aminopurine it is sensitive to UV light and DNA is not methylated so these are the three effects similarly HSDS you can see uh, th these are the this is the phenotype I will explain this a little later but here neither this uh, particular strain which is mutated uh, in HSDS it can restrict nor modifies DNA so uh, I will explain this more uh, a little later and some mutations may lead to counter uh, effect uh, with reference to the phenotypes like RECD so mutation in this gene leads to uh, XO5 negative but REC positive means exonucleolytic activity of this protein REC BCD is defective because of this uh, genotype but the recombinational activity remains uh, intact so you can have a number of different examples such examples from literature by uh, looking into the genotype and phenotype and what is the description of that particular phenotype just mating by looking at the genotype you cannot predict its phenotype because this is observable behavior and you have to find out experimentally uh, how it affects when you try to transform your ligated DNA in some bacterial strain it will take it as foreign DNA and there will be counter attack on that foreign DNA so E. coli strains they have the wild type strain of E. coli has this DNA restriction modification and methylation system and there are four section systems in E. coli that identify and destroy foreign DNA HSDRMS, MCRA, MCRB and MRR you have to take care of these restriction systems before you are going to transform your DNA in the bacterial strain the first system is HSDRMS or EcoK restriction system. In this system, the enzyme recognizes at a certain place and cuts away from its recognition site. And there is a methylation that takes place on the adenosine residues in both of these strands. And this is the site uh, that is recognized. There are three subunits of this protein. HSDR, M and S and these three subunits they act in coordination and for section all three subunits are needed meaning if any one of these is mutated the section cannot take place but for methylation only these two are important HSD, M and S and HSDR is not needed for methylation meaning if HSDR is mutated it will not cut but it will methylate so if we have genotype HSDR we will have its phenotype HSDR minus M plus 
so this r is for friction m for is for methylation and so it means the genotype with hsd r this mutation it will not restrict but it will methylate and you can also write it down in this way echo k r minus m plus or r k minus m k plus and similarly if you have any of these genotype it will neither restrict nor methylate because all three subunits are required for uh, methylation for restriction and these two are required for methylation so if any of these two is uh, mutated it will neither restrict nor it will methylate and you might have noticed that a little difference uh, from the type 2 restriction enzymes which cut within the restriction site moreover they have separate modification methylase uh, corresponding to each of the restriction enzyme so there is one restriction enzyme and then there is a corresponding modification methylase but in this case there is a one protein of three subunits which perform methylation as well as restriction now there is a chance that if the foreign dna is methylated so e coli has the defense for that methylated dna as well and all three restriction uh, systems mcr a b and mrr they specifically attack methylated dna mcr a it restricts dna modified by hpa2 methylase having this sequence and possibly by some other methylases as well similarly mcr b it cuts dna which is modified by any of the 14 other modification methylases which methylate c uh, after g and mrr it restricts dna modified by hha2 having this sequence methylation at a or pst1 having this sequence methylation again at a in this case so what is the significance of these three all mammals higher plants and many prokaryotes they contain methyl cytosine uh, in their genomic dna so if you want to uh, make clones from this genomic dna and ligate and then transform in the host the host should be mcr a minus b minus otherwise what will happen this method dna that will be cut inside the host similarly bacteria and lower eukaryotes they contain methyl adenine and if you use mrr positive strain what will happen they will cut that uh, dna but so you need mrr minus strain or mrr negative strain to uh, ligate and transform the uh, this dna which is methylated at adenines at these specific in this specific sequences but fortunately this drosoph drosophila and saccharomyces which are most commonly used uh, organisms uh, their genomes lack much of the significant methylation so you don't need to worry about these two at least and then there is a clone transfer means meaning if you uh, have ligated your dna and transformed in a bacterial strain which can methylate uh, and then it is protected and you can then transfer this to another strain uh, where it otherwise it could be restricted in that strain but if it is protected by specific methylation that strain uh, won't cut it similarly on the other hand if your uh, dna is methylated and you want to uh, transform this in a host which cuts methylated dna but uh, if that methylation is avoided in some host meaning there is no methylation then it is protected for further transformations e coli strains have methylation pattern for uh, their own safety and echo k methylase system that i just discussed earlier but there are two other methylase systems dm and dcm dm enzyme it methylates at this place on a and dcm it may methylate in this sequence or in this sequence on the cytosine 
these modifications uh, will render DNA resistant or partially resistant to some restriction and nucleases during in vitro work. And this is very important to find out this DM DCM sensitivity before you select your bacterial strain for transformation. Because if you grow your uh, foreign DNA inside the E. coli strain where these systems are activated, they will methylate this sequence if it is present. And for example, this sequence is present in the plasmid or in the, and you want to, later on you want to cut it uh, by restriction endonucleases and you want to cut it in vitro uh, by this reaction, they won't cut because of this methylation. Uh, example is MBO1 site GATC. It overlaps with this DM sequence. So if you uh, transform your uh, bacterial DNA, your plasmid, having this sequence in the bacterial strain which is DM positive, what will happen? It will methylate at this place and if you later on if you want to cut it with MBO1, it won't cut. Similarly, BCL1 that is also <clears throat> this site is overlapped with the sequence and this AQR2 is example which is overlapped with this uh, DCM uh, system. So, if this is methylated and you want to cut with the AQR2, it won't cut. So, this DM DCM methylation, uh, you must be aware of this. Apart from this, uh, DM DCM methylation also it confer confers sensitivity to MRR and MCR because of the sequence overlaps. Here there are some commonly used E. coli strains and these, these are the names of the strains and these are the genotypes meaning the mutated genes in those particular strains. So like for example DH1 this is the name of the strain and you can see its uh, uh, genotype and this genotype will demonstrate its phenotype like GYR A96 it means it is nalidixic acid resistant. Similarly, this HSDR17, this is the same one as I discussed earlier under echo K restriction system that this strain, uh, it will have restriction, uh, uh, its restriction of the restriction part mutated and it won't restrict that particular sequence, but it will methylate that sequence and once methylated, it is protected. Similarly, you can see these uh, genotypes for other strains and similarly there are more here, uh, more examples are here, but these are easily available now uh, on the internet or, or in some book. So, you can find out different genotypes of different E. coli strains and you can also find out their phenotypes. Now, after having this ligated DNA and after selecting the bacterial strain, the final step is the DNA transformation. This DNA transformation can be done with the help of heat shock method or with electroporation using some equipment. So, he, because this heat shock is very simple and most common one, I will discuss this in detail. Uh, but first, those E. coli strain, whatever you have selected, you have to make those cells competent because uh, there is no free entry of foreign DNA inside the bacterial cell and those uh, cell membrane is semi-permeable membrane. So, you have to make those cells competent to take up the foreign DNA. So, you first grow a single fresh colony of the desired strain from some agar plate into a liquid medium. Uh, this will be the starter culture and this starter culture, it will be grown as larger culture in a flask and it is monitored, the growth is monitored by taking the optical density or absorbance at 600 nanometer. So, to obtain high transformation efficiency, it is crucial that cell growth is in the mid log phase. Uh, you can draw this curve, but you, which it generally occurs at uh, OD 600, meaning you take the optical density or absorbance at 600 nanometers 
when it is between 0.4 to 0.9 so it is mid log phase and uh, with this at this value you can harvest that and use for to making those cells competent and of course you have to use all the microbiological practices and using sterile tools and labware media and regions uh, to make these cells competent and competent cells are chemically prepared by incubating in calcium chloride solution to make the cell membrane more permeable this calcium makes the cell uh, more permeable once prepared it is better to evaluate the competent cells for their trans transformation efficiency and they should be allocated coated to small volumes to minimize the freeze thaw cycle and they should be stored at appropriate temperature to maintain viability so here is a brief about it you to making the competent cells so cells are grown at 37 celsius which is equally uh, optimal growth temperature so this is the starter culture and then you transfer in the larger floss and then after the growth in the log mid log phase you treat it with the calcium chloride here i'm not giving the detailed protocol of how much calcium chloride it is easily available uh, on the internet but you treat it with this and there are some centrifugation steps and finally uh, when you make these cells competent you aliquot these in small volumes in micro centrifuge tubes and store at minus 70 celsius for longer storage and for their viability to be used later on and to avoid freeze thaw because freeze thaw will uh, make these cells incompetent or uh, make these cells uh, uh, non viable for uh, this transformation so it's better to uh, aliquot in smaller volumes now how to do this dna transformation uh, you can use uh, some equipment with electroporation but i will concentrate on this chemical transformation where you have made these cells competent by calcium chloride and now you put these uh, this tube in ice this tube contains your bacterial cells and of course there will be millions of cells rather billions of cells and you uh, incubate your ligated mixture and it is in very low uh, volume and very low amount like you just need 1 to 10 nanogram so less the better actually uh, if you uh, try to use more amount here there will be clumping uh, that may take place on the sides of the bacterial cells that will reduce the transformation efficiency so 1 to 10 nanogram dna ligated mixture should be enough so you incubate in ice for about 30 minutes and then you uh, provide heat shock by taking it to 42 celsius for 30 seconds and then again put it in ice for about two to three minutes so there is an ice incubation 30 minutes followed by a short heat incubation 42 in water bath and followed by ice for a couple of minutes after putting in finally at uh, uh, in ice for two to three minutes you transfer this material to the uh, inside the tube that contains the uh, growth medium for the bacterial cells and there is no antibiotic material here the heat shocked cells they are uh, transferred to this medium and you grow these at 37 celsius for one hour in a uh, shaking incubator at 225 rpm so 37 one hour 225 rpm so you just allow these bacterial cells to grow as much as possible in within this one hour period after grown for one hour now you have to plate those bacterial cells on petri plates containing agar and the growth medium and apart from that there is an antibiotic with reference to the plasmid or the vector 
uh, you use the same antibiotic like if the plasmid contains uh, ampicillin resistant gene you add here ampicillin if it contains streptomycin resistant gene you add streptomycin and so on and if you want to do blue white screening you have to add this iptg and xgal uh, along with the antibiotic and you uh, must use this some kind of spreader to spread these cells like you transfer the uh, material with the help of a micro pipette and then you spread with the help of this spreader and you can easily make this spreader glass spreader in your lab just by uh, using this flame uh, and you grow these petri plates for overnight at 37 celsius uh, in an incubator you should also check transformation efficiency of the competent cells before transformation is done after making the competent cells this transformation efficiency is given in terms of uh, colony forming units per microgram and you can find out it by this formula number of transformants divided by dna added to cells in micrograms into volume of transformation divided by volume of cells plated into cell dilution factor in plating so uh, all these are pretty much quite uh, straightforward uh, but you have to calculate this dna added to the cells because you have the volume of transformation you have volume of cells plated you know the dilution factor which is used in plating but the dna added to the cells in microgram can be found out by this formula dna in ligation direction divided by ligation volume into one over dilution factor multiplied by volume added to the cells here i give you uh, an example how to calculate this uh, transformation efficiency so uh, there are some numbers given DNA first you have to find out DNA added to the cells so if uh, the amount is 0.05 microgram uh, divided by 20 microliter into 1 over 2 into 5 that comes out to be this figure so here you calculate this uh, uh, DNA amount of DNA added in terms of microgram and for the transformation efficiency using the same formula i mentioned earlier so uh, you divide this number by this cfu uh, and from where this you get this colony forming units you get it from the plate that how many colonies are formed after overnight incubation at 37 celsius so these are the number of colonies and divided by this uh, is the amount of dna added multiplied by the volume used and multiplied by its uh, uh, dilution factor etc and you get this 1.2 into 10 is to power 5 colony forming units per microgram of dna now finally after doing this transformation you have to select your positive clone and i in another video i have already discussed this in quite detail but here i give you an overview of blue white screening that how you want to select your particular positive clone so this blue white screening is based on lacoprone system a part of lac z gene is present within this plasmid and a part of it this gene is present uh, in the bacterial cell so this uh, lac z gene which is a part of it is present is within the multiple cloning site of the vector so you cut open your vector from this place and you put your dna here and uh, the substrate for this lag z so half of the lag z from here and half from the bacterial cell it makes full lag z uh, protein the enzyme and there is an artificial substrate called xgal this is a dye uh, which is a colorless and when it is digested by this enzyme lag z it gives blue color and you know there is inducer is needed for this lacoprone system natural inducer it may be lactose uh, 
or 1,6 allo lactose. But here, uh, artificial inducer is used, which is IPTG, isopropyl beta D, 1 thiogalactopalinoside. This is an inducer uh, of this uh, blue white screening. So here is how it works. So you grow this uh, transformed material, you plated this in the petri plate. And there are different options here. Number one option is that there is no vector that is present inside the cell. So it means, for example, your uh, plasmid contains antibiotic resistance to ampicillin. Ampicillin resistant gene is here. So what will happen? You added ampicillin here. So any bacterial cell which does not contain your uh, vector that will be killed by this antibiotic because it does not have antibiotic resistance gene. So all the empty cells, empty with reference to the plasmid DNA, they will have their own chromosomal DNA but no plasmid DNA. Because when you do the uh, transformation, there are billions of cells. And this colony, you can see this colony with your naked eye only when there are at least uh, number of cells are 1 million cells. So you, this 1 million cells, may, they are created from single cell, originated from single cell having same genetic makeup in any particular colony. So it means when you grow these in the, when you transform these cells and uh, during their transformations, out of those billions of cells, many of the cells, millions or maybe hundreds and thousands of cells, they are, uh, they do not contain any uh, vector. So meaning they don't have any antibiotic resistance, they should be killed. Now we have left with two other options. One is that your insert within the lag Z. Or second is there is no insert, your vector is re-ligated, but no insert is there. So, if your insert is present, then you will get white colonies. But in this case, where there is no insert is present, here you get blue colonies. This blue white screening is more clearly seen in this uh, picture. You have this uh, Plasmid DNA containing lag Z prime, meaning part of the lag Z gene in the multiple cloning site. So two options are there. One is in which there is no non-recombinant or no insert. And other one is the recombinant, mean recombinant vector meaning with insert. Insert means the gene of your interest. So in case of no insert, what will happen? Part of the protein is made from here. This is alpha protein from here, lag Z gene in the vector. And this part of the beta part is made from the chromosomal DNA. The other part is present here. So there is a complementation of these two uh, parts, alpha and beta. And finally, what happens, You, when you add X gal to this, IPTG induces this system and XGAL is a substrate which is uh, hydrolyzed by this lag Z uh, protein and you get blue colonies. It means the blue colored colonies, you do not need those as recombinant ones. These are the non-recombinant ones. And what happens with, with insert or your recombinant vector is that this alpha protein is not made because your insert is present within this lag Z gene. So only this beta part is made. And when you grow these, of course you have grown these on the petri plate containing IPTG, antibiotic, and XGAL. So because uh, there is no lag Z protein fully active, so there is this XGAL is not converted into blue product and you get the white colony, meaning there is no cleavage of X gal. So what you need is actually the white colony uh, that contains the gene of your interest. So we will pick the 
white colonies uh, from this particular plate as our recombinant ones.